All right, we welcome you to Calvary Bible Chapel on this beautiful Lord's Day morning, and we pray God's richest blessing upon you as you sit under the ministry of His Word. This morning is a little bit different for me. Uh, I was prepared to preach last week, and we didn't. And uh, I apologize for uh, having to not have church last week. But uh, it's different for me because I have two messages. So you're in big trouble this morning. Big trouble. No, no, we're not going to have two messages. I'm actually going to skip last week's message and preach it next week. And we're going to go ahead and continue on with the study that I had planned for this morning. A confident communication coming from 1 John chapter 3, verse 19, and in verse 22 as well, that speaks about how a Christian is supposed to communicate. We're in the midst of a study of actually going chronologically, dispensationally through the scriptures, looking at different prayers, looking at the way that people prayed. And in this time of year, we have looked at some of the Gospels and in the story of the Incarnation. Uh, we looked at Zacharias's prayer and how it wasn't a prayer of faith, that he was asking for a child and when the Gabriel came and said, you're going to have a child, he didn't believe him. And how much, how much do we pray uh, and our faith isn't what it should be? We looked at the a wise men a couple of weeks ago in their desire to come and fall, be down, fall down before the Lord Jesus Christ as a child. Next week, in the Declarations of the Marveling, we're going to look at Simeon and Anna in an amazing study of when we bless people and how we bless people. I, I was blown away and am blown away. And uh, just a shameless plug to come back for next week. This morning we're going to look at the discernings of the Magnificent, and this is where Mary is told she's going to have a child, and this is going to be the Lord Jesus Christ, and she, she proclaims, my soul doth magnify the Lord. My soul doth magnify the Lord. <clears throat> so if you'd like to turn to Luke chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 26, Luke Chapter 1 and verse 26. This morning we're going to look at the announcement, the assistance, and the amazement. The announcement, the assistance, and the amazement. I was listening to some um, classical Christmas songs. I'll put that in very loose quotes. Have you ever heard the song All I Want for Christmas is My Two Front Teeth? It's a song about a young man who is so excited to try to get down to see Santa Claus. And I think he falls down <clears throat> the stairs and busts out his two front teeth and he can't say Merry Christmas without a whistle, right? Kind of an interesting concept that goes, uh, is very popular this time of year. So I'm going to ask you a question and I want you to answer it. And men, you're not allowed to look at your wives for the answer to this question. I don't want you to answer it out loud. I want you to answer it in your heart. And then we want to kind of take that thought throughout the message. So if I was going to ask you this question, if you could only have one thing for Christmas, what would it be? If you could only have one thing for Christmas. Now, I mean, there's different levels of answers, right? Because in my heart, I'm going to show you how bad of a person I am. Okay? The first thing that comes to mind is this great big buck that I am hunting right now. And I literally have hunted him for three years and have not laid eyes on him. I have all kinds of pictures of him, 
but I haven't seen them. All right, so that's, that's very selfish. That's a, that's a very poor example, all right? Erase that from, that's that, that, that can't be a good answer. But there could be some good answers. What about if you've been praying for a loved one? That, that would be a little bit better, right? I mean, we're, 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 we're going up the ladder now with... Uh, that, that wouldn't be so selfish. I'm, I'm thinking of someone else. And I, if I could only have one thing for Christmas, it would be that they you know, get saved, get better, get, feel, get back with the Lord. What? <clears throat> but I'm going to try to convince you this morning that even that may not be the correct answer. And please, there's nothing wrong with praying that your pastor gets a deer. <laughs> no. There's nothing wrong with praying for someone else. Please, don't, don't get that from this message. But if you could only have one thing, that's what we're going to try to ask ourselves this morning. So let's read the Christmas story, or at least a, a part of the Christmas story, maybe not the most <clears throat> famous. Of course, Luke 2 with the angels and the actual birth. What we're going to read this morning is what goes on before that. And there are some prayers in here. Okay, I, I have to try to keep my mind focused on the fact that this is still a study of prayer. This is a confident communication, part 18. Okay? So let's start in verse 26, and let's read to verse 33. This is the announcement, if you will. It says, In the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto the city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, in the house of David, and the virgin's <coughs> name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and he shall... And shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. So that's the announcement. And if I could break that down for you just a little bit this morning. First of all, the angel speaks to her personally. And I, I, I want you to catch this. I certainly don't want you to miss this. <clears throat> Most commentators believe that she was still a teenager. She's from Nazareth. Being from Nazareth, uh, you may remember that um, when Nathaniel, later on in the, in the Gospel of John, was asked to come see Jesus, he said, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Being from, I don't know, the other side of the tracks, would you understand if I said it that way? It would be like saying she lives in Bithlow. For those of you who know 
That would be funny. So you have a young lady who is told that she's going to have a child and she understands perfectly what type of conception this is going to be. For her question is, I don't know a man. You realize that there was going to be quite a bit of uh, eyebrow raising on this whole experience. As a matter of fact, if it wasn't for the fact that the angel would warn Joseph and, and encourage Joseph, he possibly could have had her stoned according to the law. But I want you to catch something. Please, in verse 28, it says, And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. So that's the first thing that the angel says to her before he tells her that she's going to have a child through the Holy Spirit and still be a virgin. He says, you're, you're highly favored. That's a pretty precious word in the scriptures. It's only used one other time. And I'd like for you to turn there. Would you turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. And we're going to start in verse 3. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. <clears throat> now the word is in verse 6. But there's no way that I can read this and only read one verse. So we're going to start in verse 3. But we're looking for the word highly favored. Okay? Paul says, and I would stress to you that this letter was written, written to a church. So we're talking about me and you here. Okay? Paul is writing through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to you and I. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. And now we look for this word in verse 6, in whom we have redemption through his blood, excuse me, verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. That's the only other time that this word is used, to make us accepted in the beloved. This is an amazing word. This is an amazing concept. Here, the angel Gabriel appears to her and he says, you have been accepted. You are highly favored. And so, speaking to her personally of the grace of God, I'll explain that. Go back now to Luke chapter 1. Do you think that the angel understood how uncomfortable this was going to make Mary? I think he did. He says in verse 28 again, You are highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou a young, uh, among women. It does trouble her. She's not quite sure what is going on. <clears throat> and now in verse 30, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Favor. Do you want to know what the word favor means? Grace. Grace. If I could explain grace to you in one simple little sentence, it would be getting what you don't deserve. Getting what you don't deserve. Is that an important concept in Scripture? 
What do we deserve? Hell. You know what we're going to get? Heaven. That's grace. That's a very, very simplistic answer. How important is this word favor in the scriptures? Well, I'm not going to have you turn there, but I'm just going to read a few verses here where this same word is interpreted grace throughout the scriptures. Being justified freely by his grace. Same word. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Romans 3.24. Romans 5. Therefore being justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. By whom we have. By whom also we have access by faith. Into the grace. Into the favor wherein we stand. And rejoice the hope of the glory of God. Verse 20. Moreover the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded. Grace did much more abound. Grace. Favor. And how about this one? For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Verse 28, he says, you are highly favored. In verse 30, you have found favor with God. So first of all, in this announcement, the angel concentrates on her personally. We must move on. In verse 31, Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Jesus means Savior and Deliverer. This is the first time at least chronologically in the scriptures, that this word is used. This name is used. In verse 32, he now speaks to all men of the mercy of God. Verse 32, and He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. So he also speaks of her people to the Jew, and to sovereignty. What an announcement. Can you imagine what this teenage young lady must be going through at this moment in her life? Ah, uh, okay. And that's pretty much the sweet answer that she will give. Mary's surrender. Mary knew what would happen but she did not know how it would happen. There is no evidence of unbelief in this young lady's life. Mary's believing response was to surrender herself to God as a willing servant. She experienced the grace of God and believed the word of God and therefore she could be used by the Spirit to accomplish the will of God. But let's move on now from the announcement to the assistance. Starting in verse 35, and I, I, I had never really caught this before. She now needs help. She needs assistance. What you don't read... In verse 34 is my soul doth magnify the Lord that doesn't come until verse 46 obviously God knows that we need help we need help with the impossible we need help to believe in the impossible First and foremost, that Jesus Christ died for you and that all of your sins can be forgiven. That is an impossible task for anyone else but the Lord Jesus Christ. But we need help with that. And I, I just found it very interesting, and I'll just uh, go through this very quickly. You're going to read from verse uh, 
35 all the way until she meets with Elizabeth, okay? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And, hey, I, I know that that's a pretty monumental task for you to swallow at this time. So I'm going to give you help in understanding and believing that. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And you remember the story of her and, and Zacharias and they're both up in years. They had pretty much given up hope on having a child. And then the Lord announces to Zacharias, and we know that uh, Elizabeth is probably about six months along at this time. And, in, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. And now the angel says, for with God nothing shall be impossible. I love that phrase. And Mary said, and I, this is so sweet, it's so submissive. Behold the handmaiden of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. But we don't read in verse, 40, in verse 39, we don't read, And my soul doth magnify the Lord. That's not coming until verse 46. So, so what does Mary need? Mary needs now more help. Um, so I have this just this little thought on the Bible uh, on the screen here. Gabriel represents God's word, right? Because none of us are going to have an angel appear to us today. God does not work in this dispensation or this part of the dispensation that way. He has revealed to us His will in God's word. So Gabriel represents the Bible, revealed truth. But we also see that Elizabeth is going to represent the church and especially the local church as reinforced truth. The fact that we need each other. There are no solo Christians. There aren't people who can just, you know, I'm all on my own and I can do it myself. That's not the way the body is designed. That's not the way that God has set us up. We need each other and Mary needed Elizabeth to be able to come to a part in her life where she could say, my soul magnifies the Lord. So, revealed truth and reinforced truth. Very important for us. If we're only going to have one thing this Christmas... Verse 39, Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe, we know this to be John the Baptist, leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb. For whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. Wow. I guess I had never really thought about this part of the Christmas story and how important Elizabeth must have been to Mary. The things that she says, by the way, Gabriel told her that she was blessed among women. And so does 
Elizabeth. Gabriel told her in verse 28, Elizabeth tells her the same thing. The church should be telling you the same thing that God's word is telling you. We should be reinforcing the truth in the way we act and in the way we live our lives, the way we worship. The church is supposed to be in reinforcing, uh, uh, telling people exactly what the scriptures say. And I just found it so interesting, can't take much more time in this um, part of the message. I am trying to abbreviate this message, I promise. I want to go back to verse 38, just real quickly. I don't want to skip over this, beloved. Verse 28, Mary says, Behold the handmaiden of the Lord. I realize that um, <clears throat> this probably wouldn't be real politically correct today. To call a woman a handmaiden. The false god of feminism is permeating this country in a way it's sickening. But do you know what Mary just called herself? The lowest form of a slave. That's what the word handmaiden means. Now, Understand, for you to have the revealed truth given to you and for you to swallow the revealed truth because the, the revealed truth is sometimes hard to swallow. You are going to have to surrender your will. You are going to have to become as Mary and say, I'll, I'll do anything you say I, I will submit my will to yours. And that's essentially what Mary was saying when she called herself the lowest form of a female slave. It's the only way to be saved. You must come to the end of yourself and see yourself as a lost sinner. You must see yourself as drowning, as the great illustration always shows. For you to come to the end of yourself and say, I need a, a Savior. And it would be no different, beloved, in our lives as Christians today. We must submit ourselves to God's will. We're not here to please ourselves. We are here to magnify the Lord. Mary needed help with her faith. And so do I. I need it from you. And you need it from each other. We need help with our faith. We need it especially from the revealed Word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. But God has set up this wonderful program called the church. So that we come together. And I get to look into your faces. And you get to look, sorry, into mine. And we get to see what God is doing for each other. And we need it. You cannot be an island unto yourself as the thought goes. <clears throat> Finally, now, we come to the amazement. Mary is now ready to speak the beautiful words of this prayer. And again, I'm trying to remind myself as I remind you that this is a study of prayer. I want you to put yourself 
in her position. Because you can. What God has chosen for you in your life should be just as special to you as what God chose for Mary in her life. God has asked you to do the impossible, to live a spirit-filled, first of all, to be saved, and then to live a surrendered, spirit-filled life, magnifying and glorifying Him. That's what He's chosen for you. Now, specifics, I can't answer that. But in a general sense, I, I want you to see yourself as Mary this morning. And I, I, I want to answer this question now that we asked at the beginning. If you could only have one thing for Christmas, what would it be? Here it is. My soul doth magnify the Lord. Well, Pastor, you don't know my... Uh you don't know my background, or you, you don't know my, uh, you don't know what's going on in my life, and, and so and so. No, 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 no. Let's not allow our circumstances to ruin the wonderful ability that we have to magnify the Lord. This should be the greatest desire. There's no doubt that Mary was chosen and she is blessed among women. She, she realizes the importance of her calling. Do you understand, do you realize the importance of your calling as a child of God? Mary is now ready for the amazement. She says, my soul doth magnify the Lord. My spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For he hath regard the low estate of his handmaiden. Did you catch it again? The submissive will of this dear young lady. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. <clears throat> For his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. I probably should have stopped in 49, uh, so I would take a point off of my grade this morning. It really should be 46 to 50. Again, she praises her Lord personally for the grace of that has been bestowed upon her personally. And I want to encourage you this morning, beloved. And no, I don't know what you're going through. And yes, it does matter to me. But can you, can you magnify the Lord this morning the way that this teenage young lady who has been put in a very, very tough situation can you? Well, then you are fulfilling God's will for your life. You are fulfilling your role in the body of Christ. Turn with me, if you will, to Philippians chapter 1. Verse 20. This is probably not the first time that you've read this verse. But I want you to read it anew this morning. I want you to soak this verse in a little bit. For this again is the Apostle Paul and he's writing to another church, the church at Philippi. And he says in this verse, according to my earnest expectation and hope. So where would you say is Paul's level here? Could I ask you what would Paul want most for Christmas? Could I, could I ask it that way? 
according to I don't know one of just the small one of my small expectations that's not what he says he says according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed and that with all boldness as always so now also Christ shall be and now what's the next word of your verse it's the same word that Mary so beautifully utters in Luke chapter 1 verse 46 my soul doth magnify the Lord so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body whether by life or by death if you were to ask the Apostle Paul the question that I asked you at the beginning if you could have one thing for Christmas what would it be now according to this verse the Apostle Paul would have said would have said I want to glorify I want to the word for magnify means to make great to declare to increase to extol to enlarge that was the Apostle Paul's desire He wrote that under inspiration for us so that it should be and could be our desire. Let's go back. Luke chapter 1. I just want to highlight again for you the way that Mary prays this prayer. She needed help to get there. I need help with my faith to be able to get to a place in my life where the most important thing in my life isn't my surroundings because man is that easy how easy is it for me to look at all of my circumstances and I'm going to be joyful I'm going to be happy all based upon what's happening around me or what's happening inside me shame shame on me it should be my earnest expectation and hope that no matter what's going on, whether in life or death, I, like this teenage young lady, Mary, who has just been told that she is going to be the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ, she didn't understand how and neither do we so much of the time we have to try to figure things out and I'm not saying to be ignorant that's not what I'm asking you but what I'm asking you is to have the faith to be able to pray a prayer like this when when things aren't going well and when the, the person that I'm praying for isn't doing what I think they should do can can we still pray a prayer like this my soul doth magnify the Lord my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. Picking up now in verse 50. She praises her Lord for what he will do for all prominently. And he speaks now of mercy. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation from, to generation. Can I give you a simple illustration of mercy just very quickly? It's the same so it's, the, it's the opposite side of the same coin as grace. Grace, let me get this straight now in my mind before I mess it up. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. I think I got it right. His mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He has showed strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He hath filled the hungry with good things. And the rich he hath sent away, uh, empty away. She praises God for mercy but not just mercy to her mercy to all the, the whole world anyone 
who will come and submit themselves, admit they're a lost sinner and on their way to hell. He is going to raise up. He's going to save them. What an amazing prayer. It's not over. He also again, and I want to call your attention to this, she prays in the same sequence that the announcement was given to her. The angel spoke to her personally, then of the whole world, and then of her nation, the Jews. She praises the Lord for his sovereignty. The last <clears throat> verse of verse 45, excuse me. He hath hope in his mercy, uh, his servant Israel, in remembrance of his mercy, as he spake to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. And a Mary, Mary abode with her about three months and returned to her own house. What a blessing. So, how'd you do? Did you get the answer right in your heart? I guess maybe more importantly, is this the way that we're praying this time of year for sure, all, all times of the year? Is there a desire in our hearts, beloved, to pray this way? I know we got a lot going on. And it is so easy to allow outside circumstances to, to bring us down. I, I, I get it. I do. I, I pray, pun intended, <laughs> that this would be the desire of our heart. My soul doth magnify the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for this time. For this blessed opportunity to look into your word, I thank you for this dear young lady, and I thank you for her faith. I thank you for Elizabeth and how she was such a help to Mary. And I thank you for those, Father, throughout my life that have been such a help to me. Thank you, Father, for times when I can pray this way. Forgive me, Father, for many times I don't pray this way. It's not the desire of my heart all the time. Let it be in our hearts and on our lips, my soul doth magnify the Lord. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen.